I am so, so, so excited to welcome onto the First Time Facilitator podcast, the amazing Phil Woods. Phil, it's so great to have you here. Yeah, and thank you uh, for having me on the podcast. And I'm looking forward to exploring some really fun topics with you this morning. Yeah, and look, look, majority of my guests on the show we've never even met before, so it's a new conversation. We, I mean, we are way back, Phil, way back. <laughs> but for those of you uh, who don't know Phil or a bit about your story, which is really interesting, can you just share a bit of your highlights reel and how you got to do the work that you're doing today? Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, so I'm an independent strategy and team development consultant, and I run a boutique firm, Catalyst Strategy. And I guess I see this as the third phase of my career. The, the first was as a lawyer, um, leading large construction mining disputes, all different parts of the world. And the things that I loved about the big cases wasn't the technical points of law and all the arguing. It certainly wasn't the volumes of documents. It was the people. It was the multidisciplinary teams that I had the privilege of leading. So that second phase, I guess that, that, that pivot point um, was a natural evolution when I moved into commercial and operational leadership roles. And I was able to apply my strategy and problem solving skills from the law to broader business challenges. And I guess that um, translated into um, hands-on uh, transformational leadership roles, supply chain, technology, um, you know, operations, people and culture. And, you know, from a sort of journey perspective, I guess, we got to the back end of uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And like a lot of people, I took the opportunity to, to travel again and get back out in the world, study a little bit and and ponder on what was next. And, and for me, I was looking for the way that I could be the most impactful. Uh, and that was how Catalyst Strategy was born. Um, so I now get to support organisations, you know, large, small, across a, a really broad spectrum of industries, um, you know, things like co-creating strategy, um, guiding the organisations through transformation. And perhaps the most fulfilling work for me personally, and, and something we were talking about recently, is engaging and, and empowering teams through um, strengths oriented uh, team development. Uh, and that's where I get the real high, I guess. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, I can see that high from you as well when you talk about it, but also knowing that as you go through this third iteration of your career, it was really building upon your strengths, um, you know, that metaphorical looking in the mirror. Now, I definitely, I'll, just to talk about one of your strengths, and I've got, you know, a couple of stories about you because we used to work together. But there was one time I had to run this, I was in charge of like coordinating this like two day onboarding thing for um, new employees. And, you know, we had the agenda, everything was set in. And then Phil emails me and he goes, I want to be on the agenda. I said, Phil, I'll give you 20 minutes, but you've got to promise it's the most engaging thing ever. And Phil delivered on that. Phil, do you want to tell them, do you remember that? Uh, yeah, I, I do remember it. Um, yeah. And look, it was all part of, our, of, uh, of rebuilding the profile of the supply chain function um, that I was then transforming because, um, you know, it was always considered, um, you know, one of these functions that everyone wanted to get around. They were difficult. They were roadblocks. We didn't want to engage when they weren't adding any value. Um, so I really wanted to get them uh, back up in headlights. Uh, so I saw this as a great opportunity to do that. And you put down that challenge, how to make it interesting and, and insightful. Uh, and I'll give the credit um, to my young fellow, Ryan. Um, at school, he'd been using these um, these quizzes called Kahoot. And I'm like, oh, that could be a little bit of fun. Um, so we designed a game show. Uh, so rather than you know getting up and lecturing for 10, 15 minutes on, oh, why is supply chain so valuable? And you know why are all these things are great? Um, we made it fun. We made it interactive. We gave a couple of little prizes away. Uh, and I'm sure that the three or four key points that we made there stuck with people um, because we made it interesting. And it was good fun. It was great. And it really just broke up the day. And, um, you know, I was a bit of, I was kind of joking saying, you know, you have to make this the best ever, but you totally, yeah, you exceeded that. So thank you for doing that and bringing the energy. It's probably uh, one of, uh, yeah, a, a consequence of my uh, achiever strength. You, you, you lay down a, a target and I'm going to go and hit it, right? Well, that's something you brought up in your response earlier was like, I didn't want to come in and, and, and you know, give a lecture, but mm -hmm. yet they still walked away with the three key insights. And so something that you've raised with me is this like, it's interesting facilitation and the work that we do because we can like serve insights and, you know, train people and tell them and serve it up on a platter. But there's also that way of like getting them to find out, you know, what, what they really think in making their own discoveries. Mm -hmm. Can you share a bit of insight on like how to balance that? Do you balance it? What, mm -hmm. what, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, really good question. Um, 
I guess um, I like to build frameworks uh, and I like to take them on a journey of discovery. And it, it sounds all a bit, you know, wishy-washy when you put it like that. Um, but really it's about tailoring a, a structure for the client's context. So um, take strategy work. Um, we might start really, really wide. We might do, you know, environmental analysis, you know, social factors, technological factors, whatever else. Um, you know, we'll explore stakeholders and then we'll start narrowing it down to key stakeholders and what their needs and expectations are before we bring it in really close. Um, but then if you flip that in the strengths development work that we do, we do the absolute opposite. We start really close. Um, we start with the individual. We start with their assessments, um, self-reflections, um, before we sort of um, develop common language and understanding and move further out to the team strength analysis and powerful partnerships, all those sort of things. Um, so for me, it's about plotting that journey of discovery um, for the client in their specific context. And I think the reason that that's effective is because it's 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 human nature to forget so much of what we hear or what we read and what we see because we've got stimulus coming at us constantly from every angle. Um, and there was a there was an American study that said um, lecture style learning. You know, it's the least effective from a knowledge retention perspective, but you know, that self-realization, that application, when you share your ideas with others, um, when you teach people about things, that's where the true growth lies. That's where it gets really sticky. Uh, and I talk about the concept of epiphanies, right? So if you have an epiphany um, when you're in a workshop, when you're in a conversation, it's pretty hard to forget it. Uh, and I guess I see that as the job uh, of a strategy facilitator, of a leadership development facilitator, um, to create a framework and I guess, curate an environment where those epiphanies can be facilitated. Yeah. You're so right about the, I mean, I love the, I just love the word epiphany and you can always even point it back to where, where you heard it or where you got that insight, where you actually physically were located when that moment struck. And it's mm. funny, like, cause sometimes it's usually when I'm out running, I, you know, I'll hear a podcast and I'll have an epiphany. It might not be like, okay, a, a huge one, but I still like, I'm like, Oh, I've got to write this down. But you know, yeah. I, feel, I don't really think I need to, because it is like, I can remember exactly what that is and what it means. And so, um, so you were talking about the power of frameworks to facilitate so that rather than giving sort of like, you know, jamming content down someone's throat, it's like, Hey, here's a framework for a conversation. Here's a way of looking at the world. Now, what are you bringing to the party? Is that how you sort of see it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, I think um, something that has really been dwelling uh, in my mind lately uh, is the concept of, um, you know, being present, listening uh, and, um, you know, taming your advice monster as uh, Michael Pungay Stania um, calls it. I think as a general rule, um, people that are called to facilitation, to strategy, team development, coaching, all those sort of things, they've got this strong desire to help. Uh, and I think that desire to help sometimes, if it's left unchecked, manifests itself in behaviours that aren't particularly helpful. You know, um, some people find themselves finishing other sentences. Um, they find themselves giving advice. Um, uh, you know, what you really need to do is X, Y, and Z. And, and often that's just not helpful because we're bringing our own context, we're bringing our own history, our own baggage, our biases to the challenge. And most of them are going to be irrelevant to whatever it is that you're supposed to be facilitating. Um, and I'm not saying that there's not a position for giving advice, right? I, I'm a consultant and people pay money for my advice. So I'm certainly not saying that. But what I am saying is giving advice, um, you know, particularly in coaching, workshop facilitation, shouldn't be the default. You, you need to be aware of you know how often you're giving advice versus how often you're you're giving um you're asking questions and, and insightful questions and that can be really really hard um because as i said a moment ago a lot of folks you know they're, they're called to these areas because they want to help uh, and you know sometimes you can see the potential pathway right there in front of you the potential solution is right in front of them but you've got to resist that temptation to steal your client's discovery. Um, because as I was saying earlier, there's so much power that comes from that self-realization. You know, in a strategy context, you know, their light bulb moment, that's key to their buy-in, to their engagement. If you serve mm -hmm. it up to them on a platter, as you said before, I think the likelihood of success diminishes enormously. But if they come up with it themselves, then they own it. 
And they're the ones that are going to have to deliver it, not you, not me. Um, so I guess it's about treading that fine line between leading the audience to a discovery and you know serving it up to them on a the platter and resisting that temptation to, to to steal their light bulbs, right? Yeah, steal the light bulb. That's a really powerful metaphor. And you're right, it's all about the ownership. Like I'd rather do something that I've thought of versus if someone just tells me to do it. I kind of feel resistance already because it's like yes. not my idea. Yes. But I'm really curious because I know, I mean, with, let's just pair this with your legal background, you know, being mm. a lawyer, because lawyers use will use leading questions to guide down a, yeah. a specific, what you know, you want them to say this so you'll lead it that way. And sometimes it's facilitates, we're brought into, you know, I don't want to use the word manipulate, but we are. A lot of what we're doing is manipulation in terms of like how we set up the room, what the process is. It's to manipulate a, you know, outcome or, or something like that. So how do you balance, you know, being like there's closed questions, we know there's open questions, then there's a, those leading questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, did you use them in your legal career and do you use them in your workshops? Yeah, um, that's really interesting. And I probably haven't reflected on that as much as I, I should have. Um, I um, was never an advocate in court, so um, never had to do that um, you know, cross-examination in that uh, sort of LA law style. <laughs> um, but I certainly saw a, a, heck, of, a heck of a lot of it. Uh, and I think um, a lot of um, the, the skill of a really good cross-examiner is from being able to ask those powerful questions um, that lead a jury to the conclusion that they that you want them to lead the to lead them to and again it's um less about force feeding the conclusion um to the jury um and more about letting them come to that realization themselves and, and it's very similar in the context that we were talking about earlier in facilitation um you know in in team development uh, and in coaching that self-realization piece uh is um, is the most helpful thing uh, and you know i guess um you know, you, you start wide, as I was saying before, and 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 bring things in. I like the funneling techniques um, from a questioning perspective, uh, and um, you know, the, yeah, I already mentioned MBS, the um, and what else? Um, you know, fantastic question to get as much out there on the table as possible before you start narrowing because if you you know you've got a theme that comes up and you dive in on that and you start to narrow in well then you're going to miss all these other potential ideas in the room and that's really dangerous um, so you get all the ideas out there on the table uh, and then start narrowing well what's driving you know xyz or or you know what's the impact of abc and and what would it mean if you know, LMNOP or whatever, we'll go through the whole alphabet, right? <laughs> um, uh, and, and I really like, um, you know, that quite often the most powerful questions aren't the boilerplate ones that you've got sitting in your arsenal. They're not the default sort of early questions you might ask to provoke conversation. They're the insightful ones that are relevant to the context of the discussion. Mm, yeah, I, I agree. And it, there's real power. Like when you have a a powerful question. It's always like sometimes people like just sit in silence, like, wow, I've never thought of, I've never even thought about that. Or like, how do you even, how do you even answer that? And it really creates a lot of divergent thinking there too. Yeah. Now, Phil, I mean, you gave the example of using Kahoot earlier in terms of like, so what you're demonstrating there is you're someone that does go above and beyond. Um, something I always joke about is the best book I've never read is it's never crowded along the extra mile. I don't think I need to read it. I, I get the, I get the premise of the book without reading it. Um, and I know you've done some, like you do some really cool things in your workshops and, you know, bring in some tech and countdown timers. Um, I think you, you were telling me about an experience like, like, like late last year when I saw you. Mm -hmm something cool that you did. Do you want to share maybe one or two examples of like how you kind of bring the X factor into the work that you do? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's trite to say it, but um, preparation is key, right? Um, you know, preparation is key. Uh, it allows you to be a hundred percent engaged in the event. You know, you're not worrying about logistics or time or geez, how am I going to bring this all together? Um, and, and obviously it depends on the, the nature of the engagement. You know, the strengths orientated work I do, very structured um, initial discovery sessions, you know, one-on-ones, um, then we build the workshop and, and off we go. Whereas the strategy facilitation work, um, you know, board leadership offsites, team retreats, that sort of stuff, um, it's much more bespoke. And I always want to take as much time as possible to learn about the client, um, to understand their context, their needs. Um, uh, so I can design a workshop that is going to take them on a useful discovery journey. And it's not about being a smarty pants uh, and you know, pretending to know everything about the client because you're not going to know as much as they do about their business, right? But it's about being able to use those insights to 
frame the powerful questions and structure the conversation uh, accordingly. So um, a conversation I had recently, um, you know, as part of the discovery for a workshop was around, um, you know, what research they had done to understand their stakeholders. And it turned out they'd just done this big stakeholder engagement activity. Great, excellent. Um, so we're not going to spend a whole heap of time in the workshop um, ideating about what the stakeholder expectations might be. We've actually got some resources there that we're going to leverage. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, in terms of some of the, the things that we were talking about previously, you know, I, I want, um, you know, I, I follow some of the advice that you've got in your book, um, you know, two-hour workshop blueprint, you know, I've got the facilitation kit, all that sort of stuff, the checklist to make sure I don't forget anything. And, you know, I've got my arrival checklist as well. Um, so um, I make sure that everything's set up. Uh, and that's really important because when folks arrive, I want them to arrive at the event. I don't want them to arrive at a room with some frenzy guy rushing around, setting stuff up and trying to dim the lights and raise the curtains and whatever else. Uh, so, yeah, I want them to enter a room of, of calm or I might want them to enter a room with all this energy and excitement. Um, so it really depends on the group. Sometimes there's music. Um, you know, my wife was saying the other day that, that I, I love elevator music because I'm always looking for the right tracks. Um, but, um, you know, there's a welcome slide, usually if it's one of these sort of event style things. Uh, and it has a countdown on there. Um, and I love the countdown because it's a really effective way to get people self-settled, self-started. So you don't have to go around corralling folks. You don't have to go around and saying, oh, look, we're going to start in five minutes, you know, um, take your seats, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's really interesting. Someone will notice it on the slide. They'll see the tick, 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 tick going off and they'll go, oh, well, we better sit down now um, and oh, well, I better get a coffee uh, or whatever it, must, uh, it might be. Sometimes I'll put helpful session info on the welcome slide. Um, you know, the Wi-Fi details, um, emergency exits, um, it's break times, all that sort of stuff. So that we can start with energy, not housekeeping. Start with gusto uh, and and really um, get them engaged right from the beginning. Because, you, you know, it's like you sit in the thing, oh, hi, I'm Phil Woods from Catalyst Strategy and we're here to talk about this and the agenda's this and the emergency exits here. Yeah. And everyone's asleep, they're bored. Exactly. I mean, that was like, yeah, never start a workshop with housekeeping. It's like yeah. the worst move. I mean, I mean yes. basically around, you know, just playing off what are they expecting? How, how can we do different things? I love that phrase, self-settled. Yes. I absolutely, because like, I really don't like, I mean, probably the worst part of what we do, I hate is like having to be like a sheepdog, like having yes. to like muster people up. I just yeah. hate that. Like, I don't want to yeah, be that sort of, I feel like a school teacher. Do you feel the yeah. same? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And then in the break times, it's the same scenario. Um, so just like the welcome slide, I have a break slide, um, you know, with a countdown. Um, and of course, you know, we're going to get back together in, in 15 minutes. Please don't make me chase you. Uh, <laughs> those sorts of things are, are really, really good. Uh, and always having a relationship um, with somebody on the team that could be, you know, your your cattle dog, so to speak, um, to do some of that for you. So you can be in your zone doing what they're paying you to do. Uh, and that's facilitate, um, you know, an effective uh, and valuable workshop. Yeah, I love that you know idea of sharing the roles as well. Now, um, yeah. Phil, you've spoken a lot about strengths, and I'd love for you to share. You know, maybe if there's one or two strengths that you think you bring into your role as a workshop host that you think um, you know that brings your uniqueness and your fillness. Yeah, look, I've reflected. I've had cause to reflect on this a fair bit um, because as I've transitioned into this third phase of my career, I'm having to lean in on uh, different strengths than I was able to uh, leverage. Uh, in my leadership roles uh, and in my legal roles. Um, so my top five um, talent themes are futuristic, command, um, achiever, activator, and strategic. Um, so really interesting mix in command probably dominated um, a lot of my leadership style, rightly or wrongly. Um, and I probably have a bit of an uncomfortable relationship with my command strength. Um, but um, in a facilitation context, um, the um, activator, um, you know, plays really, really well. Um, I love uh, engaging people and, and, and inspiring them, um, you know, to get on with things and to get started and, and what next and what could that look like? Um, and that starts to draw out, you know, the futuristic component. 
um, you know, I'm always thinking about what could be. Um, uh, and, you know, I may have a vision for what could be, but then I've got to try and spark a vision, um, their own vision of what, what could be. Um, so leveraging, uh, playing off those, uh, those, those strengths to get to each other uh, in a facilitation context um, is really fun, actually. Mm, yeah, we, we share a couple. Of, I've got um, Futuristic and Activator as well. And oh, I think, nice. yeah, I think Activator, I think it is like, it's probably my favourite um, I mean, it's good and bad, you know, because you can just do take action all the time and you're like, what What am I actually doing here? Like, let's follow through. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the, yeah. the futuristic piece um, is really interesting. Do you find um, that you're always thinking about what could be uh, and, you know, oh, but this could be even more and it could 100%. be that. Yeah. And I've got maximizer too there. So oh, it's okay. like, oh, I'm always just thinking what could be better? Like how do we, and you know, always looking to the future and never happy with right, what's right in front of me or what's right happening now. <laughs> and, that's one of the, the the wonderful things about the the Clifton Strengths model is there's always these deeper layers, uh, and um, you know every strength you know has its balcony, its basement, um, you know its edges, etc. Uh, and um, you know I think one of the challenges for people with um, you know uh, a strong leaning towards um, the futuristic strength is uh, that um, challenge of not ever being satisfied. But you know what? That's also what drives us. Um, so embracing it uh, and, and letting that take you on on a journey of you know, continual improvement, um, but also giving yourself a little bit of forgiveness to say, hey, you know what? I can see how amazing it could be, but I've also come all this way and it's okay that I'm not there because that's going to take another year or another two years or another yeah. three years. But that's easier said than done, right? Yeah, I want I want to I want the impulse for now. It's like <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, and so I feel like when you're, I mean, I'm sure people, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you you can hear it in Phil's voice. You know that sense of energy that he's got and the real passion for what you do. Um, how do you sort of transfer that energy, or like how do you keep the energy going in your workshops, particularly the ones that you know are, are longer than the two hour ones? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and look, a lot of my workshops end up being a full day thing in a strategy context and a whole day is draining, um, both for the facilitator, but but for the attendees, right? Um, you, you've got to mix it up. And something cool we did um, late last year um, with a, a technology function um, was we had the workshop um, at Top Golf, uh, and Top Golf is this um, golf driving range where they gamified it. Uh, I'm really popular in the States, so your, your listeners in the States will be well familiar, um, but others in, in Australia come to the Gold Coast and experience it. It's really cool. Um, and um, rather than ending the day uh, with a team building activity, which is a nice thing to do, um, we put it right in the middle. Um, we put it right at that sort of um, period uh, after lunch where it's that snooze town uh, and folks aren't, um, aren't quite um engaged uh, and you know they've got that bloating from lunch and they oh, got to get back into it um so you know what do some physical activity um do something interesting get their energy back up and they had competition going on it was really really cool and they came back in um all energized and ready for the last sort of two and a half three hour session where we were able to power through some really valuable content mm -hmm. uh, and um we sort of switched gears from the morning where it was a lot of ideation uh and you know, getting a lot of content out there. Um, the afternoon session was actually about bringing all that together and what, how are we going to make this tangible? Um, so that physical activity, that energy, um, we were able to then you know, leverage that to, to talk about, you know, how do we now let the, the rubber hit the road? Um, mm. So that's really, really cool. I love um, that. Yeah. You've got to also bring your own, um, you manage your own energy as well because they'll feed off your energy. Um, so, you know, lots of caffeine, if that's your um, stimulant of choice, um, the, um, uh, and um, managing your sleep the night before, all those sorts of things. Um, I Rain, hail or shine, um, no matter what time the workshop is, always do some physical exercise beforehand, you know, get out, walk the dog, um, if, you know, presenting at home um, or around the harbour or wherever you might be. Uh, and, yeah, get that fresh air, um, you know, get yourself settled um, and, and, and centred um, and, you know, you bring your full, uh, in my context, I, I'd say bring my full Phil Woods energy. Right? Yeah, yeah. Phil Woods energy is main character energy, I've got to say. Um, <laughs> but I love that idea. I mean, well, I, I, one of, I, I keep talking about one of my favourite um, multi-day events I was a participant at was Sean D'Souza's, he did a course in Singapore, but there were like more breaks than there were actual like in the workshop yeah. learning. and 
it's so true. Like you come back and your brain, like you had, your brain has time to settle. I think it takes time to form like the synapses and connections between mm, different things. Mm. And so I love that in the middle of the day, you had that team activity, it broke it. Your brain wasn't so focused in on that. And it was doing other things, but in the meantime, it was processing and sort of sorting a lot of the stuff you created that morning. And so you had, you know, that's why I sort of sometimes even argue for two half days yes. versus that full day for exactly what you said. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it's about putting the participants first, right? Um, and you, again, um, you articulate this really well in your book. Um, the you're weaving contrast, I think, is how you described it. Uh, and you know, you got to balance your your, your talking um, with activities and interaction. And, and you know, I mean, in my work, um, it's not really about talking; it's all about interaction because um, that's where you find the epiphanies. Um, you know, facilitating strategy. Um, you know, I may well have some unique insights through my external lens and my experiences but as I was saying earlier I've never got that deep organizational and stakeholder knowledge that the participants have um, so I spend a lot of time um, you know uh, speaking uh, about context setting or conversation and idea sparking and, and navigation but not lecturing or, or presenting or if I do it's going to be short, sharp, and it's to set up an activity or something like that. And I think that translates to a number of different environments beyond facilitation. It, it certainly translates to um, the little bit of coaching work that I do. It translates now, um, yeah, I can see it with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, um, to, to leadership. Uh, and, you know, I sort of look back at some of these things and go, oh, I could have done that a lot better. Um, you know, it's not about demonstrating how smart you are and the the, the wonderful ideas that you have. Um, uh, it's um, actually Kirsten Ferguson um, talks about it in her book, Head and Heart Leadership. Um, and she talks about it in a boardroom context. Mm -hmm. She calls it the word to wisdom ratio. Uh, and, and I guess it put simply, it, it's about not speaking for the sake of being heard, um, not listening just to respond um, and and, you know, contributing value where, um, you know, you can actually add value, not just noise. And I guess in a facilitation context, it's about helping bring out those epiphanies uh, mm -hmm. in the room and, and not demonstrating how bright you are. So remembering you're there, you know, to, to serve them, to help them um, have their epiphanies. Yeah, I think um, what's the word for it now? The younger people, I think the word is fl uh, flex. You know, yes. when you say you like, I'm flexing. Yeah. It's like yeah. you know, trying to one up the story. Yeah. I'm going to flex yeah. and show you my knowledge. And, yeah. really and you know what? if you're the facilitator, you don't need to flex. You're flex. already there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No flexing required. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, Phil, you, you've mentioned so many amazing things. Um, just you know, in our quick chat today. Um. Summing all that up, would you have any advice for people that are sort of first time facilitators and starting out this journey in front of groups, apart from like not flexing? Um, what else would you tell? Uh, would you tell? Yeah. Uh, well, continuing on from what we were just saying, it's not about you, right? Mm. Um, stop worrying about what they'll think about you or what if I stuff this section up? Um, yeah, nine times out of 10, um, you know, no one's going to notice um, one. Uh, and, you know, probably nine and a half times out of 10, the audience uh, is thinking about the topic at hand or maybe what's for lunch um, or themselves or something at home. They're not thinking about you. Um, so remember that it's not about you. Um, second, um, preparation is key. Um, and, and that doesn't mean, you know, rote learning scripts, um, you know, far from it. Um, you know, in my humble opinion, when you're facilitating, there shouldn't be any or many scripts. Um, mm. Structure your session well, have a, clear map, um, have some powerful questions ready, but listen, um, be engaged, be present, because the most powerful questions aren't the ones that you prepared in advance. They're the ones um, that you formulate because you're interacting, because you're engaged, mm -hmm. uh, because you're understanding the context. So listen, be engaged and, and present. And that preparation allows you uh, to do that. Yeah, I love that idea of like those emergent questions are the most powerful ones. Like you could think, oh, you know, here are 10 amazing ones. You know, these have worked in the past, but really it is about sort of tuning in to what's going on in the room and, and you know, just following your natural curiosity and seeing uh, where that takes the group. Absolutely. Yeah. Phil, uh, so great to catch up again. And um, right. we'd love to connect you with listeners if they want to reach out to you, find out more about the work that you do. Where should we send them? Um, on the web, uh, catalyststrategy.com.au. Um, on LinkedIn, my handle is Philip uh, P. Woods. 
And I absolutely welcome anyone that's interested in the things we've discussed, uh, interested in understanding their strengths. Um, shoot me a DM. Uh, I'd be delighted to keep the conversation going. Amazing. We'll put a link to all of that um, in the show notes. Phil, Excellent. always fun, always engaging and uh, yeah, always energizing just chatting to you. So thanks again for being on the show. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Of course.